Welcome again to Belmont Journal. I'm your host, Steve Rosales. Today we're talking schools, and with what better person than the chair of Belmont School Committee, Meg Moriarty. Meg, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Good Thank for you. you. So you were elected when? April of 2021, right? That's correct. And now you're the chair. Now I am the chair. That's pretty quick ascension. Did you, were you the one, did you miss the meeting? Um, it, it was something <laughs> like that, something like that. The old he, who, he or she who is not here gets to be chair I think rule. I think that's the way it went. How's it been going as chair of the school committee? Um, it's been good. It's, you know, it, it, no joke, it's a lot of work, but um, I've got a great support from all of the school committee members, and I really enjoy working with the district administration, um, and I like interfacing with, with the parents, so it, it goes pretty well most of the time. Oh, there you go, most of the time. Well, it's always <laughs> most of the time, right? So if you get it... Most of the time, that's a success. Yeah, the summer was great. <laughs> so it's now, what is it, September 28th. So school probably opened just after Labor Day. So it's been open for, what, roughly three weeks, maybe? I think it was September 7th that they went back. Okay, yeah. so uh, how's it been going? How did the opening of school go? Well, I think that there were a lot of really positive things building to the opening this year. So one of them was that we um, successfully negotiated the contracts with the teachers union at the end of the last year. Um, so there was a lot of positive energy going into this school year. And um, it started with a couple of days of professional development for new staff. I think we had 36 or 39 new, new teachers coming into the district this year. Um, so that was really positive, and um, I think everybody was really looking forward to getting back into uh, a more normal groove of, of being in person, of being without masks, um, and for, for the high school students and teachers, being in you know, the lovely new facility um, of the high school. So a lot of, a lot of positives, and I, uh, the first week actually of the opening went to um, a football scrimmage and the marching band was previewing their halftime show and there was just a, a lot of positive energy going on all around with the, with the students, with the, uh, the teachers and directors, as well as with the parents. Well, things certainly have changed. I mean, it's now, uh, well, I guess COVID is, quote, over, according to the president. I mean, mm -hmm. I see less masks out there and I see stuff. So, but how... And there was a pretty strict protocol. You can agree or disagree. Many parents had various viewpoints on how the COVID uh, protocols, if you will, were observed. Remote learning, half in-person, hybrid, all that type of stuff I'd leave to you. But but we seem to be everybody in school. What is the COVID? If, well, I'll ask it this way. Is there a COVID protocol or what are you doing? Is it still around? So I think it's really important to... Um you know, keep in mind everybody's perspectives and everybody has a different level of risk and concern well, over COVID. So, um, so the president may be saying one thing, but there are certainly people in the community. Well, who I only are, bring are... him up because, you know, <laughs> he, okay. he is the president. That's what he said. What can I say? Um, <laughs> who are still, you know, really concerned, obviously, about their kids and, and staff and teachers. And so I think that we try to listen to all those voices. And we do have um, a protocol in that is... Um, um, in conjunction with our Board of Health and our uh, health department. So the superintendent is um, in communication weekly with our health team, which is led by our nurses. I can't say enough about the work that our nurses have done in our schools over the last year, year and a half. Um, I really just don't know how they, they were able to do it, but they got everything done. So he, he's in communication with them and they're, you know, looking for trends. And so um, we have had one instance of a classroom um, at an elementary school where uh, there were quite a few students who um, were out of school with COVID and the teacher was out too. Um, so he communicated uh, with the nurses, then communicates with the Board of Health and the health department. Um, who can make a recommendation about, uh, you know, the people in that classroom maybe masking for the next five days. And in that sense, then we communicate that back to the teachers and the students. Um, and so that's the way that the communication has been working. In that one instance, it worked really well. And, um, you know, that classroom is back up and running. And so I think that that's right now really the best that we can do is to, to keep track of the trends, whether it's in a classroom or a school that we start to see numbers rise. Um, we can try to respond to that. But um, we don't have any testing in the schools anymore. Well, that was going to be my, my next question. Yeah. How, do, how do you recognize or how do you uh, 
know if there's a trend. Yeah, so <laughs> right now, um, to be honest, you know, the schools are, our school systems, public school systems are asked to do a lot. Um, they are asked to not just teach anymore, but also, um, you know, provide meals to everyone, um, be somewhat of a public health department um, to, you know, take care of safety. Um, and so we've seen this trend growing over time. And um, I think that they're doing the best they can, but they're, it also comes back a little bit to parents, and parents have to take some responsibility. And so what we're really asking is that when parents call in if their child is sick, uh, to tell us why you're keeping your child at home. And if it is in case, you know, for COVID, that that's how we would know. We have to ask parents to give us that information. And okay. so that's how the nurses so track it. self-policing and... Yeah, you would know, you know, when you were talking about the school nurses, the job certainly has evolved since I was a kid at the Winbrook School. I mean, you'd follow the playground, you'd get a cut, they'd give you a Band-Aid, maybe Mercurochrome. Still, I don't even know what that is. I don't you even know, know what that is. Well, some red <laughs> stuff on a little wand that you would put on stuff. It was supposed to be an antiseptic, I would guess, but it was called yeah. Mercurochrome. I, I'm sure it's totally obsolete at this point in time. But in any event... Uh, that's what, sort of what the school nurse's role is. I don't want to get into that, but this, now the school nurse's role seems to have evolved to, to bring in all those things that you've dealt with. Yeah, well, they still do the Band-Aids, too. Social media, emotional, psychological, Band-Aids, AIDS, AIDS, uh, this thing. EpiPens, asthma medicine, uh, yeah. All those types all of that. things. Food yeah. allergies, which I don't know. Uh, I don't know. We had peanut butter jelly sandwich every day. I don't remember anybody I going there. I don't know why that ever developed, but that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> anyway, but we're talking about lunch. Okay, so uh, when we prepared for this, we had a little chat, and I've known you. Uh, so the opening of school, and it wasn't totally smooth. You've had a couple of challenges along the way or some things that you've had to address. We have, yeah. So um, mid-August this year, our wonderful food service director left the district to take a job closer to home. Um, so we were lucky to uh, hire a new food service director who has started, uh, but at the start of the school year was still sharing that position with their previous district. Um, and at the same time, uh, uh, free lunches have continued in the state of Massachusetts, not, not funded through um, the federal government, but through a state program. Free lunches. Free lunches for all students, yeah. So the numbers of students who take advantage of that have, of course, increased in the district. Um, but with the state funding now, there are a few differences. Last year, students could just walk in and grab whatever they wanted for lunch and, and take it. Um, we now have some restrictions on that. Students have to take what they call a full lunch, a nutritious lunch. So that includes your broccoli or your apple, as well as your milk, as well as your chicken nuggets. Um, and so somebody has to make sure that all those items are on the, the plate. Um, and students also have to log in with their PIN number again, which is not something that they had to do last year. So at the beginning of the year, we had um, um, long lines as students got used to these routines again, um, and also as we've been trying to hire more, more food service workers for the front lines. Um, I know that as soon as these problems hit, we heard about it, and the district responded even to the point where our high school principal was actually tracking the time that it's been taking kids to get through the lines, reporting that back to the superintendent, who then reports back to the school committee about how those times have decreased and how students are, are now able to get their lunches um, in a much more uh, time timely fashion so that they can, you know, have something to eat before they go on with their day. Well, there you go. So so that's ironing itself out. I don't know what the quality of the lunch is or what it is, but is there still pizza day? There is still pizza day. <laughs> there is definitely I don't know who my... I don't know who is serving that pizza this year. Last year I believe it was I don't know if it was Nick's or Camila's or Gregory's, but um, there's still pizza and it's still Belmont based pizza. Yeah, there you go. So yeah. well that was the big day. We always could have pizza day. <laughs> <laughs> Chicken nugget day and pizza day, at least when, I was, when my kids were young. Anyway, uh, okay, so, well, other than that, things are good. Now, we've talked about, about the high school, so it's not totally complete. There's a whole other hunk of that being being built as we speak, The yep. what I'll call the, the junior high. What are you calling that, the middle school wing? Um, yeah, it's right now <laughs> just the 7-8 the school, the... Um, and so we'll have the upper elementary school will be the four, five, and six school. Our elementary schools will be the K through three. Um, and then we have our upper middle high school, which is the seven, eight, and then nine through 12. Okay, so how's the progress on that, uh, on the seven, eight building? Um, uh, the high school portion is, for the most part, complete. Right, People yeah. People are in it, they're Completed using it. on time. But there's yeah, the whole, the whole uh, other wing that's now being built. 
Is that on time? I don't know. Um, I know I'm, you're not on the school on the building committee, but you are the chair of school committee. So. Yeah, I'm not on the building committee, but um, I believe that it is on time at this point. And um, I do know that uh, some of the uh, grade seven and eight teachers did take a tour with um, director of configuration Carla Coza uh, through the building last year. Or sorry, last week. Okay, so when that comes on, presumably next fall. Yes. Hopefully. Okay. So <laughs> then gotta... you just hit it. Grade configuration. So. Okay, I mean, I guess I'm an old war horse, but when I came, I was first grade to sixth grade at the Winbrook School, wow. seven, eight, and nine at the junior high school, which yeah. is now the Wellington, no, excuse me, the Chenry, the Chenry. grade seven, eight, and nine, and then 10, 11, 12 down the high school. Okay. Then they did the configuration and made the middle school and made the high school four years, but that was, you know, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So now there's, you're going to do what? What's the configuration going to be now? Um, or coming next year, anticipated. Coming. Okay, so next year, the elementary schools will remain K through four. The Chenery will be a five, six school. And then you will have seven, eight in the new wing and nine, 12 at the high school. The following September is when you'll have the configuration of a K through three elementary, four, five, six at the Chenery, and then the seven, eight, nine, 12. So it's really a two year. Um, okay, transition. why two year? Why is there a trend? Why doesn't it go? So let me see. So next year, K through tw uh, four, fourth grade. We'll stay at the elementary, elementary school. Elementary school. Yeah. Okay. And then the following year, the third grade. Yep. Okay. Why does it take two years? Um, it's a big job. It's, you yeah. know, really looking at staffing, um, who's going where, um, and how are, how are those positions you know, configuring, um, and as far as I know, it was always planned to be a kind of two-year transition. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, and so that's going to operate down the new middle high school down on Concord Avenue. So they're going to have seven, eight, and one, two separate schools. We're going to, it's basically two separate schools in one big, large building. It is. That is how that's going to operate. Yeah, eventually? it's, you know, it, it might seem intimidating for a parent of a seventh grader to think my seventh grader is going into this school now, you know, with, with seven through 12. But it's really that you're going into a separate wing of the school. So seventh and eighth graders will be together. Um, and then you're still going to, your seventh grader is still going to be on a team the way that they have been at the Chenery. And so you'd really just have your team with, with those teachers. Um, and the only time that the students will be in shared spaces are for things like lunch um, or gym. And it's not as if they would be taking lunch or gym with the high schoolers. Does it's it, just a shared space. Okay. I, I can't remember. So is the is the new school, when it's finished, going to have two cafeterias for lunchtime? No. Or is there going to be? It'll just be staggered lunch times. OK, everybody together, some high schoolers, some Seven eighters. No, no, I no. They'll be That's kept separate. It's a lot of separate. kids to move it, a lot it of is, lunches. It is. It is It's going to be a lot of lunches. <laughs> yep. It's a lot of lunches, um, and that's why, you know, to be honest, we are very lucky this year to have um, a one-year position of uh, Carla Coza, who had been the previous principal at the Chenery. Um, she was hired for a one-year director position um, to really take care of all of this configuration um, stuff, for back, lack of better word, right now, um, because it is a lot of work to figure out all the schedules and who's moving where. Okay. Will the parents have a chance to hear this or have input anywhere along the way? I'm yeah. sure there's some concerns or comments, pro or con, from many parents. I'm sure say. there's both. <laughs> um, and we are open to hearing all of them. Yes, uh, Ms. Coz has been doing a great job of getting a website up and running that will have all the information on it. Um, as she goes along. She's also been reaching out to different community members and community groups to start setting up um, you know, some, some discussions that will eventually branch into larger forums. So there will be plenty of opportunity for parents to weigh in. Uh, Ms. Coza will also be coming back to the school committee to present um, the progress that she's making. And so we will be doing our best to get the word out about opportunities for parents to weigh in. Okay, and then there'll be probably some type of, uh, maybe you just said it, maybe I just missed it, Commun parents' forums, yep. open forum where whoever in the audience has a concern can get up and express their view or, or Absolutely. ask that question. Okay, uh, you mentioned a, a website information. Has it been done? Do you happen to know off the top of your head? That's, uh, I haven't asked you this before, but if you happen to know the website, that would be great. I don't. Um, hopefully she will be presenting that um, at our October school committee meeting. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's the 28th, so the, when is the October School Committee meeting? Um, we are meeting on, is it the 5th and the 18th, I believe? Okay. And then we're going to meet again on the 25th, actually, right. actually for budget. Ooh, well, we will, we'll save that. That's a nice, <laughs> we'll, we can't gloss over the budget. We'll, 
We'll get to that in a minute. So, okay, so we're rolling right along here. So now, social media didn't exist years ago, but we don't have a town paper anymore. So you can't really gauge or get an idea of people's thoughts mm -hmm. on the school and the running thereof. Uh, so you look to social media, I guess. You keep your ear open when you're down at the Star Market or at the Dunkin' Donuts. And, uh, you know, what I hear is sometimes people are saying, wow, we built this big school and we planned for an enrollment of X. Mm -hmm. And we budgeted for an enrollment of X. But the reality is that the projections are not as predicted and our enrollment is a lot less than X. Yet you have money budgeted for X. Mm -hmm. So they ask the question, where's all the extra money for the students that we don't have going? Did I ask that right? <laughs> so um, well, I think it, you're, I think you're asking in so, general about enrollment. Well, yeah, well, generally about enrollment. So I, how many kids are in this school? What's the current enrollment ballpark? So I don't have an actual, um, I, well, I could give you an actual number. Um, the district is somewhere around 4,500 okay. students. Okay, that's, that's so. fair. Okay, I'm not looking for, a, you know, 4,500 students. Okay. Let's say it was budgeted for 5,000 students. And you have a budget for 5,000, but you have 4,500. So there's 500 students that you're not, that you have budgeted, but are not there. So people ask, what happens to the rest of the money? Right. And that's a fair question. And I think so that... I asked it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think, I, 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 of course, I wasn't on the school committee at that time, but I, well, that's also, I imagine... that's also a fair thing. I'm not trying to, I'm not, this isn't a gotcha. I'm not trying, but it's a common concern. If you read the social media, and I don't know if you do or if you don't, but it seems to be a common concern among some people in town. Okay. So I would imagine that any school committee member at that time or the administration uh, is always thinking about where, you know, you're going to put the money where the students are. At the time, one of their biggest challenges was this increasing enrollment. Um, and so they were looking to put the money uh, where the students were, which is create more space for our students um, so that we could decrease class sizes. We are still, as a school committee and as an administration, trying to put the money and budget where the students are. So yes, enrollment has uh, declined and is not where it was projected to be, as you were saying. I would say that um, we have seen, uh, you know, it is not continuing to decline. So um, from this time, at this time last year to now, um, we have about, you know, 26 to 34, somewhere in there of uh, new students who have enrolled in the district. Um, and we have a tremendous number of English language learners and uh, increase in our special ed and out of district population. Uh, since September 1st, we have uh, enrolled uh, 70 English, um, identified 70 uh, English language learners in our schools. And so one thing to keep in mind is that although there's an overall increase of just, uh, you know, maybe 26 students, during the year there are hundreds of students who leave and come. And that's one thing that people don't consider. So the, the makeup of the student population changes every year. Okay. And one thing that we've seen a tremendous increase in is immigration. And this is across all districts, the state, the country at this point. Um, and so we have identified over 70 students right now for English language learners. Um, we have to provide those students with services. This has meant already us having to increase our um, staffing by two members of that department in order to serve those students. Um, so when we see those specific populations increasing, we have to respond. Um, in terms of where we're seeing the um, enrollment decrease right now, that I mean, there's there is a, a lower number of kindergarten, first and second graders in the district, and so you know, depending on how the district and and the superintendent justify that to the school committee, there may be a decrease in in a in a teacher in those grades going forward. But we have not seen that decrease at the high school or at the middle school right now. In fact, we have class 
classes at the high school um, that are over enrolled, um, specifically, you know, science classes. So, um, so again, we will decrease numbers um, of staffing to deal with lower enrollment if if that is um, justified. Uh, but we also have these populations that are increasing in, in our student population that we have to respond to, um, which may mean either hiring an additional uh, teacher to take care of that or providing um, different either special education or out of district services, which which is expensive. It's expensive. No, no, yeah. I get it. So, well, well, you've educated in Lee a little bit. So, so you have increased... Special populations. Some of the funds are being used to provide English English classes, English as second language, is that exactly. what it is? English as second, so yeah. something that I don't know was as prevalent back in the day as it is perhaps now, Correct. given the immigration uh, situation that you just alluded to. So some of it is being spent there, uh, some of it is being spent uh, for out of district, special education, uh, IEPs, those type of things, I mm -hmm. think, uh, those type of situations. Uh, I think that's what people want to know, is it being wisely spent? If it's not being spent on the, the, the students that we expected, is it being spent wisely in other ways? So, okay, you, you give me a, 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 re, a very legitimate answer. So. And I think another thing that we really heard from the community um, was that they value our educators in our district. I mean, our, our teachers are part of what make this district um, known as a good district. Um, and like I said, we did uh, negotiate those contracts last year and, um, you know, gave competitive wages, wage increases um, to teachers and to staff across the board also. And so that adds to our base budget um, that compounds year after year as well. So that, okay. that's also, and, and, and that's something we heard from the community and then okay. we responded to it. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. That's, I didn't want to give you a loaded question, but it's, it's, it's. That's the nature of the question, I guess. <laughs> so we'll turn something. So well, wait, So you have overcrowding or you have more students at the high school, middle school level than you have at the lower grades. Correct. Is that a trend? Do you think they're going to continue? I don't know. I, I can't That's legitimate, that. too. I don't yeah. know. Because I, I can remember the PowerPoints. I've been a town meeting member for, I don't know, 40 years or whatever. Yeah. So you look at the PowerPoints put up there by the superintendent or your predecessors saying we have enrollments. But it never really told me, to my memory, where those increases were occurring. So I'm surprised to you. I would think that more people are moving into town with younger kids. Mm -hmm. That would be my impression. I mean, my mom passed. She had a five-bedroom house. Who's going to buy a five-bedroom yeah. house? Certainly not me and Debbie with no kids. Someone with a lot of kids. Yeah. Put them in the schools. Probably younger grades. That's probably what I would think. But that doesn't seem to be what's happening, what you're experiencing. Well, we're, yeah, like I said, I mean, it's really, we're just seeing this right now in the first, you know, two to three grade levels. So we'll have to see what happens after after okay. things get back to normal again. That was sort of again. driving some of that grade reconfiguration, too, to lessen the, well, we'll see what happens. I guess we'll just see what happens. Uh, okay, so you mentioned budget. So I didn't leave you much time, so we can run out of, you can run out the clock <laughs> when you deal with the, the budget. But let's talk uh, some money. So the budgeting, you're going to start with the budget. The process is brand new. I had a... Uh, our new finance director, assistant town administrator slash finance director on um, earlier in the Belmont Journal, and mm -hmm. she was saying it's a new process. So says Mark Bolo also. It's going to be, we look at revenue first, what do we have to spend, and then figure it out rather than what we've been doing in the past. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, what, what are your thoughts with respect to the budget process going forward here? So right now the schools have been asked to present um, a, you know, a, a moderate uh, level services budget. And so what that means for us right now is really thinking about our budget in uh, three buckets. And I like to think of the first bucket as kind of rolling over what we're doing now from our, our general budget. And like I said, that might mean looking at the grades and seeing where we might reduce, you know, um, a teacher if we don't have the enrollment there. Um, but it also might mean looking at those special populations and making sure that we're servicing them. So that that's really the first bucket that that we will look at and look to the superintendent to justify any uh, changes that are being asked in that part of the budget. Uh, the second part of the budget are the um, the the staff that has been hired with federal funding. 
Um, so those are things like our social workers um, that we never had in the district before. We had never had SPED team chairs in the district before. These are positions that other districts have. Um, and we use federal funds for them. So we will look to see what the impact of those have been and uh, whether they it is justified keeping any of those positions. Those are, so the one-time federal funds? Those were one-time okay, federal so funds. So those are not recurring funds. Okay, those are so, not right, recurring so, funds. All right. But we will look to see if they are, are really needed to provide level services for our students um, for next year. And then the third part of it is the opening of the new 7-8 school. And so what is needed uh, in terms of staffing for that. And so that is our first ask in terms of uh, what we are supposed to bring to the table. And then based on those numbers that Jennifer comes to us with in terms of revenue, there'll have to be discussions about uh, what can or potentially cannot be funded. Yeah, Jennifer being Ms. Hewitt, the Ms. finance Hewitt. director. OK. That, that, OK. So we're going to have, we have new building. Well, we're going to have a brand new building eventually. So uh, maintenance. That seems to be an issue, too, as you go around town. So is maintenance of these buildings part of your budget, the school committee but school budget, or is that part of the town's operating budget? Or so actually, the because... talk right now is to take facilities out of the schools and um, make it uh, kind of its own uh, budget in the, within the town budget. Um, the way that it's worked right now is that there is a, you know, one, uh, Dave Blazin is the director of facilities, um, but the schools, we have custodians who work in our buildings, um, and then there are the custodians and facilities for the town side, too. Uh, but I do believe that there is some talk about uh, combining those at this point. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff, but, but the... the the heating systems, the solar systems, the solar array, all those things are all, uh, they didn't exist back in the day, but I assume they are sophisticated equipment and machinery that needs to be operated and maintained uh, yeah, I think to work they, right, to work they had properly. to um, so. hire somebody for the new high school system, I know. Um, but that being said, you know, our schools wouldn't operate without our custodians and no, no, our maintenance. I'm not, no, no, I'm not saying that. But <laughs> They're the bread and a, butter. It's an enormous building, so it I is. don't know how many you have on staff, and I know they work very hard. So this is not certainly not a knock on them, but they can't be one person can't be doing all of those functions, I would think. No, and actually, I think we could use some more. I think at this point, with the number of custodians that we have, they are probably also training for ultra marathons by having to uh, walk probably 15 miles in that large building at this point every day. You know, I would think if they gave you, you know, what do they call the little step try? I have one here. What is it, a Fitbit? Yeah. If you gave them a Fitbit, I'd probably be uh, pretty amazed how much they really do walk in there. I think so. I think so. There you go. So, well, we got a couple minutes left, so... You know, we've covered a lot. I hope you're going to come back from time to time and give us an update because I think this is pretty valuable. I've learned a lot, and I tend to think I try to keep myself relatively informed. But uh, so you're doing this. It's a labor of love because you certainly don't get paid. Probably takes more than time than, than what you do for, for uh, employment. Uh, but you have to have some fun. So I've asked you, well, what do you do for fun? Um, I, well, I, I like to be active, so I have always uh, had a love for, for running, and I dabble in triathlons a little bit. Um, I you dabble in, <laughs> you dabble in triathlon, okay. I dabble in, you know, uh, other things, but. Uh. <laughs> we all have our things. Um, I, I really enjoy the beach, so I enjoy going to the ocean um, and uh, being with my kids and my dog and um, doing some cooking and what kind of dog? We have a Springer Spaniel. He loves to swim. Really? Does he come out jog jogging with you? Uh, no, he does not. That's my own time. Okay. What's the dog's <laughs> name? Wilbur. After uh, Wilbur. the first yeah, the first chapter book we ever read with the kids was uh, Charlotte's Web. Oh, well, there you go. So, so Wilbur. Yeah. Yes, I asked the question because. Uh, uh, I had a previous guest that had a dog, and I failed to ask what the dog's name was, and I got chastised by our Cracker Jack staff. So <laughs> in any event, Meg, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming. I hope it wasn't too bad. No. There you go. Well, there you have it. Uh, another edition of Belmont Journal in the Books, with where we chatted with the chair, the chair of the Belmont School Committee, Meg Moriarty. So on behalf of our Cracker Jack staff, Jerry Meserve, our producer, Joanna Zuvlis, and myself, host Steve Rosales, Take care.